I am burdened, and though last week I was still burdened, but not, not clear in all that I needed to present, and I guess this would be an extension to last week's message, though really I've titled the message, While the Bridegroom Tarries, still looking at this passage in Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39, and we might read that quickly just to remind and refresh our, our memory as far as what we've been looking at in the, this, uh, this series. And the series is titled, The Certainty of the Things You Have Been Taught, taken from uh, the, the Gospel writer, Luke's uh, 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 encouragement really to Theophilus. Um, and that's found in Luke 1, 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you are instructed. But I guess really the summary of the whole gospel I, I see in my mind, and this is the way I've termed it, is, is the importance where Christ says of himself. When, when he came into that throng, that gathering of people, and he was given the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he found the place where Isaiah had written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. No man can take this passage to himself because we reside under his anointing. Our focus is not on the miracles and the signs per se, but on the person and the work of the Saviour, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the thrust of these messages, to be refreshed in the things that you've been taught, the certainty of the things you've been taught. But our passage, Luke 5, 33, Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, why do the Pharisees but yours eat and drink. And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece of new garment on an old one. Otherwise the new makes a tear and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. The new wine is, must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. So the question is posed by those who were gathered, Pharisees, bringing to light John and his disciples and what they were doing, what their religious service has been, their practice to, to fast, to make a decision that they would abstain from food and, and keep the, the imposed traditions and laws that had been applied to the, to the nation of Israel. Filtered down and really uh, extrapolated out from Moses' law. But Jesus cuts across their thinking immediately and, and draws the, 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 the centrality to himself, the picture of the bridegroom. How can the groom's friends, how can those who have gathered when he is here fast? Jesus goes on to further bring the response in two parables that reveal really one truth. There's been much speculation and very few theologians agree on the interpretation to these two parables Jesus paints for those who brought the challenge of why do your disciples not hold the traditions of, or teachings we hold? 
I guess we've got to really pose the question, what are parables for? What's their purpose? Brother Bill Randalls writes the foreword in the great work on the kingdom parables by Pastor Philip Lewis Powell. And Bill writes of Pastor Philip, a seasoned pastor and teacher of God's word, reverently opens to us the familiar yet unfamiliar stories Jesus told to those who have ears to hear. Mark 4 verse 23. Bill Wright continues to write, I use the expression familiar yet unfamiliar because that is the nature of parables as Philip will certainly explain. Jesus used parables not necessarily to make the teaching simple and childlike as many erroneously surmise. The parables of Jesus are designed to obscure the teaching as a judgment upon the hard-hearted and at the same time to bring revelation to those who are earnestly open to God, to those who are actually poor in spirit, teachable, receptive, or again, as Jesus would say, to those who have ears to hear. Far from being mere children's stories, you will see that in the parables are hidden some of the deepest, hardest hitting and crisis orientated teachings in the Bible. Jesus resorted to parables when it became clear that the nation of Judah would not hear when Israel had rejected him. To the remnant along the mysteries of the kingdom. Turn with me briefly to Matthew 13, verse 11 and 12. Matthew 13, 11 and 12. Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not being granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance but whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. But to the rest of the nation, the message is this. Matthew 13, verse 13 to 15. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Zion is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on saying, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their ears. Sorry, otherwise they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and I would heal them. Close quote. Some commentators express the thought that the Pharisees want to hold on the old ritual And they decried Jesus' change in the way he approached life, his teachings, the way he approached even their customs because they couldn't stomach the new. Yet, there has also been much overlay of Pentecostal and charismatic thought to make the wine represent the Holy Spirit and other erroneous assertions, or that the garment is something else, both paving a path away from the central truth. In moving aside theories, we must remember what the purpose or 
point of the parable is as instruction. A parable most often paints for us one distinct truth which was necessitated by an event, a discourse or a question. Such examples include the lost sheep, the lost coin, the the prodigal son, each found in in Luke's gospel chapter 15. One specific distinct truth is brought to light. In this situation, it was a question or challenge Why are your disciples not fasting? Yet the point is this. What is right for the followers of Christ to be doing? Jesus' declaration in verse 35 is pivotal to understand what the disciples of Jesus would be doing while he, for a time, is preparing for us a place. Verse 35, read it again to refresh your minds. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. The conclusion or the point is that we don't do those things which are contrary to the relationship we have with the bridegroom. That's the point, that's the thrust. You don't put on new patch on an old garment. You don't put, a new, put new wine in old wineskins. The bride does not fast while the bridegroom is with her. But that day will come when the bridegroom has been and will be taken away. So it brings... Th- for us, there is resounding truth. What is the right? What is right for the followers of Christ to be doing? It's an interesting question. Just as an aside, I follow my train of thought here just for a moment. There are over 101 titles and names ascribed to Jesus, who is the Christ. I have pages (laughs) that I, I copied out to remind myself of what the Spirit of God breathed to remind us who Christ was. Inversely, there are 45 titles ascribed to the church. There's more to express and explain who Christ is than even who the church is. While the bridegroom tarries, what really is the bridegroom coming back for? Two questions then. What is the right and proper thing for followers of Christ to be doing? Secondly, While the bridegroom tarries, what really is the bridegroom coming back for? These thoughts have arrested me these last days as I've meditated. Our Savior was taken away, and as we presented last week, the words used in this passage in in verse 35 bring to light that uh, uh, under duress, uh, under an exactment, Jesus was going to be removed and that was the the result. His life was taken from him at the hands of sinners. False declarations made about him. But yet he stood without voice, without declaration, seemingly impotent, 
Yet all the fullness of God dwelt in him. And as it's been said, he could have called 10,000 angels. But no. Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And our bridegroom has now been translated, as it were, brought up and caught up to the heaven. The angels declared to those who are watching and looking on, why do you gaze here? This same Jesus will come again. He's gone to prepare that place for us. John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I've gone to prepare a place. If it were not so, so I would have told you. If I go, I will come to you again. You know the verses. They warm our heart because there, there is a, an assurity. There is a hope. There is a quickening in our hearts because the risen Savior who rose from the dead, who God the Father raised from the dead, has raised in us the life of Christ. Therefore, our hearts commune with him. We're no longer trapped by this world. We're no longer under its bondage or its sway, but we've been released to serve and to walk in newness of life. Never to be subservient to the world and, 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 its, and its influences again. Yet, we find that the church is languishing. We find that it's under the sway of sin. We find that it's under the sway of influence of the world. It's, its ideologies, its theories. It doesn't stand resolute and separate. For the call of the gospel is to be holy as he is holy because a bride is one that must remain pure and clean. Even though that Christ has gone, what has he provided for us while we wait? The calmness of his voice when he speaks that still voice into our heart. Not in the whirlwind. Be still, and know that I am God. His care and his protection are assured. His tenderness towards his beloved is evident because of what he has done on Calvary. His love that stills our heart for God is love. Christ is the expression of love. God demonstrate his love in this way. And while we're yet sinners, Christ died. His long suffering with us is unquestioning. That he walks with us. That even through the decisions and choices we make, he is still our brother. He is still able to lift us out of the mire and bring us his unchanging faithfulness. I am the God that changes not. Faithful. Faithful to what he's said. Faithful to what he's promised. Faithful to do all that is in his authority to do and there is nothing that is not in his care and providence that can be removed from his hand. What else has he provided? The freedom from sin and its bondage. He's given us the joy of full salvation. His grace to meet every hour his provision for every need. This is what he has provided while we yet wait for his appearing. 
This is the provision that is is wealth. Remember that Ephesians speaks to where we are seated together with him. Turn with me. Why don't we just remind ourselves, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul writing while in prison and he is so overcome with the, the immensity of this one who has gone before us to prepare for us that habitation that we will dwell with him eternally. And Paul doesn't know where to put the full stop because everything he considers all of life is found in Christ, the sufficiency of all things. And Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in in chapter 1, verse 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him because in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. The immensity of the provision, the immensity of the glory that is in Christ is incomprehensible because the eternal God has supplied all of our need, knowing our frame, knowing our frailty. The bridegroom has supplied his righteousness. And he has bestowed his righteousness on those who are unworthy. Yet he has brought nigh through his precious blood. The immensity of the gospel, the work of grace in one life, is incredible, but then multiply that by all who come to faith in Christ, that he saves sinners, that he washes the unclean, that he sets straight the crooked, that he he heals the brokenhearted. His healing of mind, of body and soul through, through the passage and the, and the course of life. He strength, strengthens those for the journey. He is the rock of salvation in the storm of life. He is the light to shine and dispel the darkness of sin in us and all around us. We are warmed and strengthened by the trust in his word to do all he said he would do concerning his promises. And finally, the expectation of the consummation of the marriage supper of the Lamb when that day when the clouds will be rolled back and the glory of God will be manifest. And in a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye. We shall behold him. This one who has gone before. The bridegroom who in our estimation seems to be tarrying. But I'm so thankful that he doesn't come at our whim because his long suffering is calling every heart. His long suffering is allowing the church to, to, to shake herself from the dust of apathy, to put off the, 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 the gaudy robes of this life and, and to put on again the homespun truths, the homespun garments of sincerity and truth. So the question must be asked, what is the expectation of the bride? If the bridegroom is tarrying and we've been given this time to ready ourselves, what is the expectation of the bride? Turn with me please to James Chapter 1, James 1 and verse 19. James 1, James 1, 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let each man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the imparted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. The expectation of the bride is to be pure, chaste. This is something that can only come if one separates themselves from this life. not talking about asceticism and uh, being so isolated where in times past they would climb a pole and sit there not in the world not able to contribute to the world not able to even testify of Christ's work but as this idolatrous 
presentation of, look at me. I've set myself apart, you wicked sinners. That's not the call of the gospel, is it? That's not the call of Christ because he calls the whosoever will. The life of the Christian, though, is one that is set apart but is so moved by what is around him that the work that he purposes to do doesn't bring glory to oneself but glorifies the one who has given us life. That's where the rubber hits the road. This is where works has life. I didn't say faith. Faith is already given. We already have faith. We've believed. We've been converted. But now what is in us propels us onwards to do that which would be pleasing and acceptable to him. This aspect of purity has escaped so much of the West because it is so bombarded with impurity. The indoctrination by, 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 by Hollywood and, and the media in all forms. And sadly, now it, it's so readily available. I am always arrested by reading Matthew chapter 5. Turn with me. Refresh your hearts by reading this passage and seeing the disposition of a Christ-centered life. Then he opened his mouth, in Matthew 5, verse 2, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Friends, don't long, no longer do we submit ourselves to the impurity of this world and this life. Whatever the situation that presents as a temptation, you must run. It says flee youthful lusts. Young people, if I can encourage you, don't submit yourselves to an environment that controls your thought life, that controls the vision of your eyes. Run from it. Run and flee youthful lusts. Purity. Purity. Because our desire is to see him. And without purity of heart, constantly being washed by the word of God, being refreshed to look into the law of God and be cleansed by it, seeing who we are, knowing what we are, and being changed by the glory of Christ in us as he is let loose in our hearts. It dispels the wickedness, the fear, the frustration, the pain, the anguish. It's gone because Christ is made center and he's made alive in our hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart. That passage goes on. Please look in verse 13. This is the life of the saint. A sinner bought with the precious blood. Now a saint in Christ. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. The disposition of the bride of Christ is longing for fellowship with the groom. The bridegroom 
is not with us at this moment in, in physical form, yet we know he is with us by the Holy Spirit and the blessedness of the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost as it used to be termed. We need a visitation of the Spirit of God in us to, to know the quickening of his enabling for every moment and situation that we face. We need a Pentecost today. We need the overflow of the Spirit of God so that we may remain witnesses. Because the world's resolve is that he wants to rip from us the glory that we hold so dear. Jesus, they don't want him. They've rejected him, but he is the light. The light of the world. The light that we cradle, the light that we hold as light bearers. The disposition, as I said, of the bride is to long for fellowship. And as we stay pure, separated, consecrated, denying the flesh, putting to death the old, Christ can be seen. The fellowship with the groom is not on our terms. but on the Father's terms. We seem to think that we have a right of passage to heaven. We're so eagerly waiting for going home But if we think that we're going to arrive there based upon a life habitually broken and distorted by sin, not surrendered, no, no victory because the cross hasn't reached every area of our heart, we will sorely be mistaken that heaven awaits. Heaven awaits is heaven because the holiness of God, the triune God dwells there in his fullness. And he desires us to be with him, but it is not on the basis of our righteousness. It is only on the basis of Christ that we have access. If we continue to live a life of sin, it is as the writer in Hebrews, Hebrews reminds us that we are again putting underfoot the very blood of Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it is briars, thorns, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. And the writer addresses this idea that if we continue on, we are turning away degree, degree by degree, where we are no longer being able to confess Christ because we have chosen the world and we've left our love. 
John as he wrote to the churches in Revelation. Repeatedly called them to repent. Otherwise their candlestick would be removed. That is the testimony of that church would be removed because it meant that those followers who were in that church had chosen the world and not chosen Christ to follow him. The call to Matthew the Levite, who his name was Levi, who wrote the gospel. We, we spoke about it several weeks ago in our passage. Follow me, he said. And as I said, it's the hardest thing for humanity to do to follow Christ because it means a surrender of everything we are and taking on all that he is. Paul writes to the Romans. Romans 6, turn with me. This is so confronting. It should cause our hearts to bow. Romans 6 and reading at verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died in sin Live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we were, have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Know this, that our old man was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And this sets us at liberty the work of the cross This sets the heart right if we have given everything and have kept back nothing. What is the bride coming back for? Sorry, what is the bridegroom coming back for? Christendom at large. The tainted evangelical church that has ascribed to the ecumenical movement even that the fundamentalists which we would really try and ascribe to ourselves, have linked with. We can no longer say that we hold to sound teaching because the ideology is that we need to compromise so that we can work together. It's better to have unity. Unity surpasses everything. Unity under conformity, really. Do as I say. Not as I do. The only basis of unity is truth. Truth of the word of God. Sound orthodox belief. Sound faith. Articulated truths that we live by. The word of God isn't up to opinion. It is truth that we can follow Step by step, precept on precept, line by line. We can understand it. We can follow it because we're following him. It's not out of compulsion. It's not out of a rod of discipline. It's about of a heart expression so that we will see our saviour. 
we love him because he first loved us and gave himself a ransom for us. Never is it true, a truer set of a time period than that we find ourselves in the time of Laodicea. Turn with me, please, to these arresting chapters in the book of the Revelation of Jesus. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3 and verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. What a confrontation for those who claim to have Christ, to know Christ. Heirs of grace, heirs of salvation, yet They're saying they've got it all. If they don't have Christ, we have nothing. If Christ is not with us, we have nothing. We're we're boxing at the air. We're clamoring for something, but it's not there. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is he living on the throne of our life? And here Laodicea have gone so far to say, I'm rich. I, I have it. Yet they are empty, void of the substance of salvation. They are void of Christ because it goes on to talk about how Christ is standing, Jesus is standing at the door and he knocks. Yes, it can be for the individual heart, but here it's to the whole church. The church has missed the point. They've become self-sufficient, opinionated. The the, the doctrine of men's opinions is, is... Pervading everything. The correct response for a born again sinner now, a saint in Christ, will have a disposition of mourning. Our passage is talking about fasting. When I'm gone, you will fast. But the Pharisees were trying to impose, you're not fasting according to the law because they have made it a decision. I have to keep a set of rituals, a set of writs, and that will keep me. And that will make me sufficient against the day I see him. No. A thousand times no. Jesus' response was, how how can the friends of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is with them? But that day is coming when they will fast. The, The instruction is not a decision to be made that, On this day, I must fast. On that day, I must fast and and meet my religious requirement. No, it's because a heart, a bride, is so moved to be with an intimate relationship with the groom, in in communion, in, in, in knowing the fullness of his embrace, is desired more than life itself than the substance of food. And can I even place this caveat here? Than the technology that we have become to rely upon even for our very existence. Can we fast from technology for a period because we would rather be alone with the Lord Seeking his face in prayer, imbibing his word and reading it, knowing what he requires of me 
and responding. The problem with fasting, if it's made as a decision, then what will happen is we'll be so consumed with the natural body needing to satisfy the hunger that is generated. Any spiritual benefit is completely washed and removed from us. But fasting, as I see it in the right context, is the response of a heart to forsake everything, to just be with him. And if that means that we, that we miss a meal, so be it. If that means that we've got to turn off the TV, turn off the internet, throw our phones away, so be it. We've come to depend on these superficial replacements for information. And we don't go to the source of life. And we wonder why we struggle with so much temptation and, 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 and the world encroaching upon our lives. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me Verse 18 of Revelation 3. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in the white garments that you... That, sorry, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed... And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. What are we doing while the bridegroom tarries? What is the expectation of the bride? To be adorned, pure, white clothed in linen. What's the passage? Revelation. Chapter 21. Look at it with me, will you? Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven. Oh no, sorry, I think it's 19. Let me. Verse 20. No, no, where am I looking? I haven't got it underlined. Uh, yeah, I was 21. Sorry, 21, I am right there. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth to the first heaven and the first heaven, first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Oh, that day, the finality of all things, every judgment by a God who sees and knows will be done. What is our response to him? Are we so moved to follow him? Are we continually, habitually ignoring the claims of Christ to be pure, to be righteous and hunger for righteousness, to be meek. The blessedness of that communion with him is when we walk away from the world and we stay clung to the cross. We stay there See the splendor of the one who gave himself a ransom for our lives. If 
Last thing I see comes as a response of a heart so moved to be in communion, fellowship with him that it forsakes all. We must have continual and right responses to the claims of Christianity in our life. It must be like day and night to the world as they see us and as we live and move and have our being in this generation to call them from the brink of destruction, to call them back because there is such hopelessness in their lives. And we hold the light of truth. We hold the Prince of Peace. And we extend him out. Come. Come. Um, Revelation also says, the Spirit and the Bride. Verse 17 of 22. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him who's, who hears say, come. And let him who is thirsty come, whoever desires, and let him take the water of life freely. Come. Exchange your filthy rags for the righteousness of Christ, that garment that would envelop us and keep us identified as a bride, perfected, waiting, expectant for his return. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that your word again would penetrate our hearts, that we would respond, Lord, rightly to you. Lord, if we have been so stubborn, And even saying that the situation that I find myself in holds me bound to this sin. Lord, I pray, grant us your grace to acknowledge our failing and our fault. Naming the sin, Lord. Calling on the name of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, Lord, we pray. Help us take the courage that we have an armor fit for the battle, able to defend our position of faith in Jesus in a world that says he doesn't even exist. He's a myth. But Lord, we know in whom we have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed to him against that day. Oh, Lord, I pray, change us and make us like Jesus. Let us walk in truth. Let us walk uprightly. Let us walk in purity and in sincerity, we pray. Lord, eagerly waiting for your appearing and not ashamed Not ashamed, Lord, at your coming. But Lord, we pray for the hastening of that day because we so long and desire to see you. Thomas was able to say, my Lord and my God, because he touched and handled. And you said, blessed are those who believe yet have not seen. Oh Lord, but by faith this morning, we have seen you. You have risen in our hearts. The light of the gospel has penetrated. Prepare us for heaven, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.